we'll talk about much at our men's breakfast coming up. It's a movie called The Notebook, Tear Jerker, one your wives probably wish you'd go with you. But in the story, this relationship came about, but her mom did not think he was right for her, and he went away in the military, and he was writing her every day, and the mom would get the mail and intercept the letters and hide them and not give them to her. And here's this girl that loved this man and longed for some sense of communication. And you hear this in this, this conversation. I don't know if you could hear it very well. It was kind of muddy in the sound, at least up here where I'm standing. And she said, why didn't you write me? I waited for you for seven years. If you know the story, while well, she thought he had given up on it, she ended up being engaged to someone else. And he comes back in the picture but she longed for him. She waited. She wanted to hear from him. She wanted communication. He was stretched by miles, and he was writing every day and wondering why she wasn't responding, and there was this longing. Well, today we want to look at how God longs to be with you. He wants to be with you personally. He wants to hear from you. He wants communication from you and with you. Yeah, you and me. So I hope you'll get your note sheet and follow along with us. If you're new with us today, we're in a journey called Absolutely, as we're looking at the absolute truths of Scripture and declaring without shame in a world that doesn't want to believe in absolute truth that there are absolute truths, and they are found in God's Word because His Word is absolute truth, whether they want to believe it or not. Absolute truth is true for everybody, everywhere, all the time, can't be changed, and it does exist. And today's absolute truth, as you see the title on your outline, is God's been dying to see you. God's been dying to see you. Last week, our absolute truth was a day's a coming. When we looked at the fact there is a judgment day. And it's going to be a terrible day for some and an exciting day for some. It just depends on what side of the equation you're on. So yes, there is a judgment day. And I think Satan uses this, this reality of God as judge to instill fear and make people not like him very much, who don't know him personally, that they don't really care to get to know him. They don't need another judge in their life. But today I want us to lift up, yes, he's going to be that judge, but today we're going to lift up his heart in this day that's a coming. And we're going to look at the big picture to show you what God's heart is. And so the first couple of blanks you have there are that we were created to be with him from the start. We were created to be with Him. It's our design. It's intrinsic in us as human spiritual beings that there's a part of us designed to be in relationship with God. God made man. Go all the way to the beginning in Genesis. He made man, placed him in the garden. He gave him instructions regarding the trees, tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. You'll see in that that God brought the animals to Him so that he could name them. You see this kind of partnership and relationship going on in, in this whole thing called creation and starting to move it forward? That God didn't just make the animals go by him. God brought them to him and included him in the process. And then we know through the story actually of the fall itself that the Lord walked in the garden with them. There's a good old song many of you know of, he walks with me and he talks with me. He tells me I am his own. That's what we were created for. A personal, walking, partnering relationship with the Almighty God. And in Genesis 3, as we go to that story of the fall, verses 8 to 9, here's what, what man deciding to do his own thing caused then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. There's a change. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Oh, the Lord knew. But you see, the, the, the change not only hurt us as mankind, that we hide from God, that we have this separation, but it hurt God's heart. Where are you? And, and we see it through Jesus as he's sharing about the kingdom. He, he says the kingdom of God is like 
a man who has a hundred sheep and one of them gets away and is lost. Will he not go and leave the 99 and go to find that one that is lost? That longing, that question of that, where are you? And he came to seek, and Jesus came to seek. And there's a parable of a coin. Which one of you, if you lose a coin, will not sweep the house and move the furniture until you find that coin, that, that cherished thing that was lost? This is God's heart, that we were created to be with him from the very start. And Satan likes to provide a bunch of counterfeit answers to try to fill that that void in our life when we are separated from Him. There's something missing. And so, as we grow up separated from God and not knowing Him, it must be in human relationships. It must be in physical sensations. It it must be in whatever we find. Wealth, riches. But it's it's a void that really is meant and designed for God. And, And we were created to be with Him. And because we've been lost to Him, God has desired to be with us ever since. He's never lost that longing. You know, you'd think we sinned, he'd write us off. But he didn't. He's desired to be with us ever since. All through the Old Testament, many places, many times, you see quotes like this, and I will be with you. I will be your God. And you will be my people. Fear not. Yes, I'm calling you to something tough. Yes, this is going to happen, but I will be with you. I will be your God. And over and over and over again as God is calling to us. Where are you? I'm here. I'll be with you. Psalm 116.15 is kind of a weird verse to, to put in a message of good news, but we celebrated it yesterday with the Stidham family again as we celebrated two weeks ago their father Ollie passing away and then Beverly we celebrated her life yesterday but Psalm 116 15 says this precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints see in our humanity that's a weird statement (laughs) that's a really weird statement to to mankind that that death is precious we we spend how many dollars to fend off this thing called death and our love for life is a good given gift from God that's fine and okay. But of those who are followers, who God would consider saints, followers of his, those who know him, those he's with, by their openness and their invitation, they're in relationship with him. He loves it when we die. (laughs) Because he gets to be with us. He gets to bring us home out of this place where sin has caused all these other things that are not a part of his plan in our existence. It's like that longing to be with a distant loved one. Now, God can be with us by his spirit just as intimately and personally in this life. Don't don't misunderstand that. But I do believe it's very different going to be in the fullness of his presence. Now he manifests himself in the ways our humanity can handle, but then we will see as he sees. Whoa, that's going to be different. But the Lord loves it when he gets to bring us home. We'll remember that a little bit later as we get further in his word. And because he, he's been longing to be with us ever since, he had, there was a barrier that he had to do something about. And so your next set of blanks are simply, Jesus has been dying to have us with him. Jesus has been dying to have us with him. I know I, I'm a little cheesy sometimes the way I play on phrases that we use a lot. But, but, you know, we say, oh, man, I've just been dying to go to that place. I've just been dying to visit so-and-so. I've just been dying. To, we say that a lot. We don't really mean it. But literally, Jesus has been dying for the sole purpose of being with you. There was no other reason but to reopen relationship with you. Um, were you with me when we went to the USC game and I'd left my wallet on the street? Was that you? We were going to a USC game, and if any of you have been to the Coliseum, you know what part of town it's in, right? And if you don't pay to get in the main parking lot, you're parking on some streets that, you know, you wish the car was a little closer when the game's over at night. And, and we were, I wasn't sure if I was going to park in a lot, so I, had, I got my wallet out and I set it in my lap, so in case I needed to pull into a quick parking lot that had a good deal, I'm going to have it right there, you know, and Nah, we decided and just found a place on this little kind of industrial street several blocks away from the Coliseum. 
I forgot my wallet was in my lap, and I opened the door, excited to get to the game, and just jumped out of the car and shut the door and locked it and started walking to the Coliseum. And we're about three blocks away from the car, and I'm thinking, I'm going to pull my shirt tail down so I don't get pickpocketed. And I go to pull my shirt down, and it's gone. Oh, no. And I remembered last having, I went running back to that car as, as best as these 50-year-old legs could do it with bad knees. It probably looked hilarious, you know. But, and it hurt every step, but my wallet. <laughs> and I got back there. We had walked slowly, and I ran all the way back, and there it was sitting in the street next to my car, and I retrieved my wallet with a group of some folks who needed my money more than I do <laughs> coming down the street just before I got there. You ever lost something like that? And you're like, the sinking feeling. <laughs> and I ran through the pain to go get my wallet. And that's just earthly, temporary stuff. Well, God came through desperation to retrieve you, to retrieve relationship with you and with me. I'm going to read a big portion. You're going to have some small pieces put together on your screen of Ephesians 2, 11 to 18. Therefore, remember that you... Once Gentiles in the flesh, so he's speaking of the cultures, the Jewish versus Gentile cultures. You are, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And so here he's still talking to the Gentiles about the division they had culturally and even in the worship, the structure of the worship, where Jews could enter in closer to the presence of God and, and Gentiles had to stay further out by a separation of a wall, even in the worship of God that they had. But Christ removed that barrier between, and he's saying he made the two, Jew and Gentile, who will follow him. He's made both one, broken down the middle wall, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. So this is still between people. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. Reconciliation to each other to be reconciled to Him. Conversely, reconciled to Him reconciles us, makes us one as one body. We are one body with New Life Church up the street. We're one body with Cerritos Church, Church of Cerritos and Cerritos Baptist down the street. Now, we have some differences that we believe and cherish and teach, not in competition, but just in passion for what we believe to be right and true. But we're still one body of believers. So and Jesus came to reconcile everyone to himself, Jew and Gentile, people that are his people and people that are not, foreigners and aliens, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. See, it was by the blood of Christ, it says, you who were once far off were brought near. It's no mistake. I know it's no mistake that God inspired the use of that word. He doesn't just want us to please or appease him. What's pleasing to him is being with him, and there's things that we do that keep us from being with him. <laughs> so yes, he, he wants our choices to allow us to be with him, that, that we're seeking to please him with our life. That total desire is really the, the, the fruit or the, the producer of holiness, that I want to live a life pleasing to God. And, and he, but he wants to be near. Do you feel like God's far off? today? I, I don't know what signals you're looking for. I don't know what kind of emotional things you're looking for. 
But I want to tell you, God is eager to be close to you too. And he wants you to sense that presence. He died to be close to you. He did say in this world you'll have trouble. Being close to you doesn't mean your troubles go away. Being close to you doesn't mean this life gets easy. But as we, I was just thinking about the series we did a while ago, When God Doesn't, and focusing on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they said God can deliver us from the flames, but even if he doesn't, praise be to his name, he'll be glorified. But how he, he didn't deliver them from the furnace, but he was in it with them. And it made all the difference in the world. God sees the furnace you're in, and he wants to be with you. He brought us near together with him and with each other. Well, that closeness isn't just even this external outside presence that we feel. And I love those times when I feel that. I hope you've, I hope you've had times in relationship with God where you felt him just coming and, and wrapping his arms around you and, and just you can't explain it. But he wants, God wants to abide with us. That's your next set of blanks. He, he doesn't just want to be close. He wants to abide with us. Jesus said it in Matthew 28, 20, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As he's sending his disciples out, they're going to they're gonna end up being martyred for their faith and for their ministry. It wasn't a human rosy path, but I'm with you. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I said at Oliver's funeral that, you know, religion is a crutch, but a relationship with God is a calling. And, and it, I mean, when, when those disciples were following a man who was killed for being who he was, what do you think is going to be their challenge? <laughs> we're, we're following a man who this world killed for being who he was, and we still live in this world. It's going to be tough. It's, it's going to be things we need to deny and resist, and, and we will face resistance. But God says, Jesus said, and I am with you always. First Corinthians tells us how in 619 it says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? He wants to live in us. And as believers, we receive him, we ask him to forgive us our sins, and he comes in. He does live with us. And we take him with us everywhere we are, everything we do, everything we say, Every time someone cuts us off on the road. There's been some times, I don't know, Raleigh, if you ever felt that here, but there's been times when someone, you know, I'm just kind of like, oh, you know, someone doesn't turn left at the signal out here when there's like room for 20 cars to turn left. And I'm just kind of like, what are you doing? You know, I'm just, I just raise, I don't honk. I just, I'm like, what are you waiting for? And then as I turn left and they turn left and then they turn right into the church parking lot because they're bringing their kids to our preschool. And I'm like, I hope they didn't see me going, what are you doing? <laughs> yes, Pastor James. Hi, good morning. Glad to have you in our preschool. Where was I? Oh, yeah, I know. God is with us. He abides with us every minute, every second. And that's his desire. But he does this, and it's amazing how he does this. You have some uh, apostrophes there or uh, whatever you call those. Yeah, is that what those are? Yes. In customized harmony, God is not a cookie cutter. God is not a cookie cutter. Now, we've got to be careful to say that as he customizes and makes each one of us different, and why I put these words together, because customized, our world could say, well, this religion is a customized way of knowing God, and this religion is a customized way of, they're all different ways of God being with people. They're all customized, you know. No, we're not taking, that's why it's customized harmony, because as he dwells with each one of us, he makes each of us like him. He makes us holy, and everything he does in us is customized holiness. It's in harmony with his heart. It's in harmony with his character. It's in harmony with his message. And so there is diversity in the body of Christ, but it is all in harmony with him. Psalm 33, 15 tells us he fashions their hearts individually. I think this is in the English Standard Version that it uses that word. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. We just went through a series not too long ago in our community groups about our gifts 
I'm encouraging you all to take the survey online of your gifts and abilities, your spiritual gifts assessment. But in that series, he just lifted up that verse that says, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for you to do. And so that's, he's considering the works he has for you to do and fashions your heart in line with your place and your purpose in his kingdom work. It's all in harmony to bring a beautiful unified effort with all the bases covered. But so God's not trying to make you like me. Aren't you glad? God's not trying to make you a Billy Graham, and you're no less of a Christian if you're not a Billy Graham. I'm no less of a preacher if I'm not on Billy Graham's platform. I'm doing what God's called me to do where he's called me to do it. And that's all he wants of you is he wants to abide with you and customize you. He knows your heart and how you're shaped. He's not trying to make you into your parents. But he just wants to get the soft clay of your life on his potter's wheel and shape you for your purpose. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, God cherishes you. So he doesn't just want to do that with us now, but your last set of blanks, I believe, is that God wants us with him forever. He won't even get tired of us. I preach a little bit long, and you guys are tired of me in 10 more minutes, you know. And we, how many times are, you know, we go to retreats and somebody's on our nerves a little bit after two days, and boy, you know, <laughs> we get tired. Of, but God does not get tired of us. He wants to be with you forever. He will not get tired of you. Why, does it, why do we say this? Well, Jesus proclaimed it in John 14, 3. He says, I'm going to come back. I'm going to take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. I want to be with you. I want to be with you in the furnace. I want to be with you in this life. I want to change you and transform you into holiness that you have a purpose in the midst of the fire that you're walking through. And someday I'm going to take you out of that fire and there won't be anything burned on you and we're going to be together forever without any of that stuff. That's where the deliverance comes. That's where the freedom comes. And he can't wait to do it. Precious in the sight of God is the death of one of his saints. Get on out of that place. It's time. I'm done with you there. Come on home. (laughs) That's how God desires to be with us. As I said last week, we talked about judgment day. It's a coming. A day's a coming. There's a reckoning. And we talked about some of that ugly stuff that aren't we glad that that stuff is going to stop? Sex trafficking is going to stop. Addiction is going to stop. Oh, it's going to be great. But it's going to be a terrible day for some. But here, I just want you to listen to how God pictures that day. How he shared it to John the Revelator. And think of everything we've talked about today, about how he created us to be with him. He lost us. And he's been, where are you? Where are you? And and how he wants to be with us while we're here in this flesh, in this journey. Helping us be overcomers. We're not removed fromers, we're overcomers. (laughs) But we will be removed. And and here is how he pictures it. Think about his heart for us to be together in a dwelling place that's kind of like a city together. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Hear the relationship? I bawled like a baby when Amy showed up in the back double doors of our church at our wedding. That's what he relates this to. We are his bride. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle, the tabernacle which represented his dwelling among men. The tabernacle of God is with men, with, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And we jump to chapter 22. 
Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. See him bringing it back full circle? The garden, the way we were created to be, full circle. And may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. You skip a verse and it says this, but the Spirit and the bride say come and let him who hears say come and let him who thirsts come whoever desires let him take the water of life freely that is the ending of the terrible book of Revelation with all the scrolls and, and bowls of wrath being poured out and, and blood up stadia deep, whatever that means. I should have figured it out. But this horrible, terrible day that's a coming, look at what God's heart is in this as, as this weeds and wheat that we talked about last week that are grown together are going to all be cut. And then the separation process, what comes into the barn and what goes into the fire that we talked about last week. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. It's going to be called tribulation. <laughs> but here God, as a bride beautifully adorned for her husband, the bride and the Spirit say come. I'd like to invite Linda up. She's going to sing a song that's going to help you think and reflect on God's message from his word today about how much God wants to be with you, that he's been dying to see you. I don't want to ask you, do you hear him today saying come? Is God today looking at you? He sees you. He knows where you are. But in his heart, relationally, is, is his relationship desire going, where are you? How many days does God come to walk in the garden? Okay. How many days does God come to walk in the furnace with you? But your eyes are on the flames, or you're like Peter walking on the water, that he saw, the, he saw the waves and began to sink. And is God saying, where are you? I'm here. Are you spending time in his word? Are you in relationship to begin with? Heavenly Father, as we listen to this song of what you did when you were literally dying to be with us, may you call, may each person hear your spirit. Speak to each one according to their need this morning. We continue in a spirit of prayer.
thank you, Linda. And the cross said it all. See, God could have just called us out of the mess, but He came to be with us in it. He came to endure it with us and for us, meet us in it and overcome it for us. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never answered the call of the cross, that the cross is God saying, I love you this much. And maybe you've never answered that call and said, yes, God, I am a sinner. I've needed that sacrifice. I've not been in relationship with you. Thank you for showing me how much you want to be in relationship with me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Is there anyone here today that you've not made that step? You've not answered the call of the cross, God's voice from the cross, and you want to receive that work today and say, God, I do want to be in relationship with you. I've always thought you were just this angry judge. I was listening to the things of the world. I've been choosing to do my own thing like Adam and Eve did, and you've probably been going, where are you? I don't want you to have to call anymore, God. I want to, I want to walk with you every day. Anybody here want to say, God, please start a new relationship with me. I want to ask you to forgive me my sins. Anybody here that I can pray with before we go? to start that relationship with God through this gospel message. I'll lead you in a simple prayer. All right. That means, hopefully, that we've all answered the call of the cross. And now we need to answer the calling of the cross. We are his people that are still here. God wants you with him. He he looks forward to the day you die. How's that for a loving message to today? <laughs> but he does. So why doesn't he? Why doesn't he just bring us all home and end this thing? Because as much as he wants us with him, there's a greater purpose he still has for us here. The call of the cross on your life to be saved is the calling of the cross for you to be an agent of that salvation, that agent of that message of his salvation to others. The only reason he died is to save you. The only reason once you're saved, you're still here, is to help him save others. Amen. That's it. That's the whole reason this building is here. The whole reason we meet and gather and be in community groups is, yes, to grow and be in that relationship with them together, but so that we can, we're still doing, we're going to do that in heaven. We'll be together in his presence better than ever. So the reason we still do it here is so that we're still here with those who need him. Today's St. Patrick's Day. I see a lot of green. On the news this morning at 6.15, when I was getting ready to come in, there were people lined up at a bar in Westchester for green beer. At 6.15 in the morning! <laughs> I wish people would line up to be in the presence of God. St. Patrick wasn't about green beer. He was about this gospel message. He evangelized Ireland. He sacrificed his life to take the gospel, his well-being, his comfort, his to go to Ireland where he had trouble. He had heard a calling through the Holy Spirit that was the people of Ireland saying, come walk among us. And he answered that call. And so we have to answer that calling. You, God's word says, are an ambassador of his you're a diplomat. Did you know that? You are a diplomat. A diplomat of heaven itself. To be an ambassador of the message of salvation. And let me give you some good news, and it might be a little bit scary too. You are the best instrument of the gospel in the lives of people around you that God has. You can be more effective in their life than I can. And they don't see me. They don't know me. They may come and hear a message and I hope God would use it. But you are called to be salt and light. You are the diplomat. You are the best instrument. Don't be afraid. Be bold. And as we get ready to close today, we have a responsive reading that you know, Kathy directed my attention to. A newsletter from Ireland. Our, our friends that we made and we went on our work and witness trip. Ted and Sarah Voigt that were working with the Morleys there. And their, their March newsletter has a responsive reading. So today on St. Patrick's Day, we have a responsive reading from Ireland itself. And all I want you to, well, all I want you to say, because you don't have a copy in front of you, is come and walk among us. Can you practice that? Come and walk among us. One more time. 
come and walk among us. I will cue you. Let this be. Listen to the journey of talking about St. Patrick, but then bringing it to ourselves before we go today. As Patrick heard the voice of the Irish people calling, and so he returned to a place of hardship and suffering following the call of the Lord. Lord, may we so respond to your call. May we too hear the call of our neighbors, friends, and co-workers. May we hear the call of the broken, the lost, and the marginalized people often forgotten. And by walking, may we notice. And by noticing, may we feel. And by feeling, may we act. Help us, Lord, to be present in the places where you have placed us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Before we go in a spirit of worship and praise, I just want to give you some information about opportunities for us to continue in fellowship together. So watch the video, and then Cole will come and lead us in our closing song. Thanks for worshiping with us today. And we hope that before you leave, you'll stop by our resource table to get details and more information about things we're about to highlight here and even more. There's a copy of our monthly newsletter that you can actually have sent to your email every month. Just go to our church website, cerritosnazarene.com and sign up. On the back of your sermon outline this morning, you'll find information about tonight's gathering with our own Bible man, Dr. Dave Wolf. Questions and answers about the Bible at 445 with the Sing and Study at 5 p.m. There's also information and an invitation for you all to the wedding celebration of our own Wendy Nessel Road to her beau, Nicholas Knudsen. Our women's ministry is having a rummage sale on Saturday, March 30th. And in your handout, you'll find valuable information about the times, about when and how to get your donations here, and contact information for any questions. Men, the time is now to sign up for the Anaheim District Men's Retreat at Oak Glen Christian Conference Center. You have information in your handout with a phone number you can use or you can sign up at eventbrite.com. And ladies, you can start signing up for the ladies' tea that is May 11th. We invite you to stop by the women's ministry table to sign up and then you can use the flyer to invite a friend. And last but definitely not least, we have a wonderful variety of community groups available to you. We hope you'll find the listing at the table or on our church website and find the group for you today. Again, thanks for joining us today, and we hope you were blessed by the presence of God among us. We hope to see you again soon, and hope you bring a friend with you. Now let's stand and let's exit his courts with a spirit of worship and praise.